Hi there, I'm Rich Folley. This is PBS Book View Now, and we're at AWP 2017. And I'm sitting with Roan Ricardo Phillips, whose most recent collection of poetry is Heaven. Welcome. Thanks so much, Rich. Happy to, to be here. here. This book was long listed for the National Book Award in 2015. Um, it was an amazing book of poems. Before that, Ground. Um, but I'm interested in the idea of heaven and what it means to you and how you found your way to this from ground. I've heard some stories about what prompted you to write this collection of poetry and I'd love for you to tell me that story. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is I tie it a bit to the birth of my first daughter, Imogen. Um, I was having lunch with my editor, uh, Jonathan Galassi, um, the day that my wife went into labor and I was, I'd finished uh, the ground and I was thinking, what's next? And he said, you know, um, what are you thinking about? And I said, well, you know, I'm doing some translations of Dante of Purgatorio. And he said, why don't you try Paradiso? I think it's much more fits your temperament. So I started translating some of Dante's Paradiso. And from that translating, I just started kind of writing my own poems about the idea of yeah. heaven and it just kind of oxygenated into. So first of all, Paradiso is, is Dante's ascension into heaven. And that's the third book in, in that series, in the obviously, comedy, in the yeah. Divine Comedy. Um, and we just skipped over the fact that you do translation, which we're going to come back to, because I think it's a really interesting element of your life and career. But uh, that, that element, what was it when you were translating that book about heaven that sort of caught your fancy? And then when you're writing poet, poems, do you really write into that concept, or are you collecting other things that you've already written? Uh, well, I think in response to the first question, I found myself really thinking... Um, keenly of the difference between paradise and heaven. They're not the same thing. So Dante was on his way to paradise, but this way that we casually talk about like, man, it would be heaven to be on a beach right now. Man, it would just be heaven to have some ice cream right now. There's a way in which heaven works in our day-to-day -day casual life that's not so here in the upper reaches of the brain. And I found myself really moved by the way in which it can be a highly intellectual thing, it could be a highly spiritual thing, or it could be a really highly on the ground type of day-to-day -day thing. Uh, regarding having a topic, it's not as much that I wrote, thought, now I'm going to write poems on this topic, but it really just became kind of like the key signature that my imagination was in. So it was less rich, I'm going to write these poems on this topic, and more that the poems I start to write were just all kind of tying in. I tend to very much be in seasons of thought when I'm, when I'm doing things, you know? Mm -hmm. Just like a painter, sometimes they're working with like black canvases for a few months or something like that. And, you know, that's how it kind of sprung to life. Yeah, so in, your, in the, the stories, so many of the poems are about the def different definitions of heaven. I mean, it, it, I, I got the sense that there's friendship that in some cases you, t you write about kids oh, yeah. you grew up with, and then there's music and, and the, the sense of joy that comes along with a lot of music. You quote a lot of lyrics in here, um, like Wu-Tang Clan and, and other rap lyrics oftentimes, but other things too. And then more sort of specific like definitive ideas of what heaven is are in here too. When you were thinking about that definition of heaven and paradise, I guess, and the combination, um, what does it mean to you as you're thinking about it? And did it provide any sort of direction for you as you're thought, thinking about it? Oh, wow, that's really great to think about. I mean, my imagination, just like I hope my day-to-day -day life is about inclusivity. And I love the idea that heaven is not an individual place. It's not like you go to, you finally find your cubicle in heaven. But it's kind of like this open space where we're all being um, beautifully complex, but also beautifully connected. And I really like the idea of thinking about a space where both the sweet and the sour part of being, doing things that feel sweet to you. Sometimes when you are 17, those things feel really sweet to you, but they're wrong, but it's a form of being in heaven. And sometimes you're doing things that are really beatific and you almost feel saintly because you're doing the right thing at the right time. That's also a type of heavenly mode of being. And I just love the fact that when I was writing this book, I was just thinking about the ways in which we can all kind of occupy a single inclusive space that gives pleasure and joy, but also pays forward the idea that we're human beings who have a connection or just trying to do the right thing by one another. That's to me what poetry and art's really about. It's about paying forward some sense of beauty and ache for whoever comes after and you hope that they kind of dive in and run with it. Yeah, there's one poem in particular, maybe you could read it for us actually, that I think speaks to that really succinctly. It's Kingdom Come. Oh. 
Yeah. Would you mind reading that one for us? I'd be happy to. Okay. There's a, you can read it to me or you can read it to the camera, which is right in front of you. Sure. Whichever one you'd like. I'll read it to, I'll read it to the camera. Kingdom come. Not knowing the difference between heaven and paradise, he called them both heaven. So when he shrugged at the thought of a god, blanched in the lights of implausible heights, thumbing the armrests of a throne, that was heaven. And when he stared out at the sea, feeling familiar to himself at last, he called that heaven too. And nothing changed about either paradise or heaven for it. Paradise retained its earthen glamour and heaven because it can't stand for anything on its own, like the color of rice or a bomb, was happy to play along, was happy just to be happy for once and not an excuse for mayhem. That last line, beautiful, first of all. Thanks. Uh, that last line and not an excuse for mayhem. Can you explain the, the thinking behind that? Give it a shot. Um, you know, as much as I want to think about heaven sweetly, we can really, like anything else, appropriate it for our own, for our own goals, for our own ideals. There's a way in which the idea of heaven becomes ideological, right? So you have people making grand sweeping claims about what people should or should not do, or enacting terrible acts and moments of violence um, because they think that there is a heavenly goal that they will attain. Um, these are excuses for mayhem. And the idea of heaven being something that can stand for itself, can give pleasure, that to me is what heaven is in its richest sense. It's not an excuse to do wrong. Um, and it's not kind of an ideological corner of a map that you would occupy, either in real life or in your mind. But it's rather this inclusive space. Yeah. Right? You know, you, you talked about kind of writing in certain, you have like palettes of the moment or things that you're kind of working on or ideas that you're sort of with for a few years. But at the same time, you have these other careers. You write <laughs> uh, magazine articles and you write a lot about sports, basketball, soccer. Um, now tennis. And tennis, right. Yeah. Um, and you also are a translator, which affects a lot. I mean, you obviously speak other languages. I think you speak Italian, you speak Spanish. Talk, Talk to me about now. that part of your life and the role translation has had on how you see the world in general, but mm. certainly how you see literature. Yeah, well, you know, my wife is from Barcelona. Um, we speak Catalan at home and go between the two places a lot. I think Catalan is just such a beautiful, rich language with a great literary tradition. Um, and, you know, I grew up with Spanish around a lot. I grew up in New York and I'm the kid of immigrants. I mean, my folks are from a English speaking island, but just the idea, I mean, they have accents. All my family, if you met them, the generation before me, they have accents I'm very used to linguistic um, difference of all types of varieties. My ears attuned to it. Um, it's just something I'm used to. I love the way that translation makes everything always in process. Like in Italian, they won't say break a leg. They say in the mouth of the wolf. I love these types of moments where all these eo, uh, idiomatic expressions, they have different lives and textures. Um, but also, honestly, you had mentioned sports. You know, I grew up trying to get the grainy, um, reception of Italian football, you know, on the TV when I was a kid. And, you know, particularly with um, football or soccer, the language is so reduced that you could start to understand things. What kind of like header is or corner kick or good pass, whether you're catching a game in Italian or Spanish or French. And so, you know, I think about sports not in a rah-rah way, but really in a way in which it gives me a greater connection to the world, and certainly language, and even now my work as a translator, in part I think came from that also, just kind of um, growing up, trying to find soccer games and whatever type of language. Um, but also, you know, I grew up in the Bronx, and you know, we would celebrate Puerto Rican National Month, we would learn like the Puerto Rican National Anthem, La Borinquena and all of this. I grew up reading poets like Lorca and Valerie, it was just, Books were always around, um, but always just also the sense that we're a global community. And, you know, American is this weird mix of Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, but also kind of like Latinate movements. And understanding good poetry and writing good poetry, as I think, understanding and having some control of um, your Germanic side and your Latinate side, right? So sometimes you'll say think or thought, and sometimes you'll say conceive or conception. And they're really different 
sides of the same idea. So even when we're speaking English, what did Stephen say? English and French are the same language. We're always kind of, you know, all of our American names that come from elsewhere, we're always in some mode of translation if we let it happen. Yeah, you know? it's an interesting perspective that not many people have like you have. <laughs> well, you talk about reading so many great writers when you were younger. Where did that love of literature come from in you? My mom, no doubt. My mom was always um, quoting Shakespeare in the house, always. Um, you know, I always had books. Uh, one of my uncles gave me complete works of Shakespeare for Christmas when I just turned 10. It became my favorite book. Um, but also, yeah, just, you know, literacy is really important. It's not something to take for granted. And the imagination is a great gift. I mean, you know, when it's cold and rainy and you can't go outside and play, or even when you can, but you decide, I'm going to sit here with this good book and finish it, you know, you feel like you're making a choice. For me, sitting with books was also about a choice. And that, for me, was really beautiful. Yeah, there are times when you're in school and you have to sit and read this. But when you're home and you say, you know, I'm going to decide not to go outside now. I'm going to sit and read this book. It's, it's kind of empowering. Yeah. Kind of empowering. It's very empowering. Well, the way you, your love of literature and your love of poetry and, and certainly understanding of translation has also affected your sports writing, I think. You write, there's another sort of level of it. It's not reportage so much as it's sort of an examination and you really do incorporate the beautiful game aspects of these things. I really appreciate it. it. Thank you. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thoughtful sort of approach to sports writing. I think there's a connection there that, can, that maybe people who don't necessarily read Lorca or your poems but might actually find their way to that, that literature thing, the way you're writing about sports. Right I would now. hope so. That's a really kind, beautiful thing to say about my sports writing and that's what I, that's what I aspire to. So, yeah, thanks for that. It's, it's all about inclusivity. I feel as though people know where they can go, either online or in their newspapers or magazines to find a certain type of sports writing. Um, but I'm really, the way that I, for instance, write, I know that you love soccer. The way that I write about soccer is honestly the way that I would talk to you about a match. And it took me a long time to really kind of um, publicly embrace my love of uh, sports. I've always loved sports, but I never really wanted to be identified as a sports loving guy. Um, cause I think there's a lot that comes with that, particularly when you're an artist. Um, but I've always found kindred spirits and had talks with them and written with them. And, you know, it's those people in my life who really kind of encouraged me. They were like, would you please, instead of sending me this 5,000 word email, will you please publish this someplace? Yeah. And so it's been really kind of an organic transition for me into something that was very kind of intimate and private and dialogic to opening it up to the world. And if anybody of any persuasion um, likes those pieces, I'm, I'm really moved by that because I'm writing it for them. So we're, we're at a time right now where I, I know that I walk around with this love of literature in my head constantly and I want to share it with as many people as possible. I want to bring them into this world uh, because it's been enriching for me, but I think that it can be enriching. I can't prescribe how to do it. I can't tell someone what the book is going to be or what's going to be the magic place. I can suggest something, but it really has to be that sort of personal epiphany of finding it, of loving it, and of finding that step, step process into it. As I walk around right now, I feel like every, we need, everybody needs, you need to read more. You need to, and, and you hear like people saying now more than ever, so often, you know, right now, at the time we're in right now about literature and books. Do you feel a, a responsibility to sort of share that love you have, or do you just go out and do your thing and hope that people find it? Um, you know, as far as sort of being a dis you know, a, a disciple, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts about literature in general and spreading that word? Yeah, you know, there's a moment in a poem I love, Vacillation by Yeats, where he's completely moved. He's just turned 50. He's in London. He's sitting in a coffee shop. And suddenly he goes, and 20 minutes more or less, it was so great, my happiness, that I was blessed and could bless. And I, I, I feel as though, I've mentioned before, paying it forward, I don't obsess with the now because the now always becomes the past, right? You always become dated or cheesy or your ideas. If you read Dante's Paradiso, his whole sense of the cosmos is completely wrong. I mean, ultimately science or morality or ethics or law makes us wrong. That's what being in the moment is about. So I kind of accept that, the diaphanous shifting nature of whatever is the present. Um, and I write to leave a testament of my joy but it's the artists who come after who, you know, breathe life into whatever you did and make it feel new and urgent. So I don't 
overly concern myself with responding to the present because the moment that you do that, the present is moved. It's like a, uh, it's almost like a shell game. I'm very much in my moment. You have to, you have to feel things on your skin. Um, and the, the, the work that you write has to be very alive on your tongue and in your throat and in parts lower. Um, but I, I, I don't find myself now more than ever X. But if we had thought about that five months ago and 10 months ago, so we're always in this position where we're chasing this sense of now, but now it doesn't really exist. So I just try to get it down in the realest, most sumptuous way that I can. And hopefully there's a, a mind, an ear, a person waiting to receive it. And if not, the artists of the future, the poets of the future, they're always the ones who choose what will be read, choose what's passed on from hand to hand. So um, we had literature for it thousands of years before we even wrote it down on animal skin, much less uh, paper. So, you know, I like to think that the good stuff gets found and, you know, passed forward, not always and not perfectly, but I just strive to be happy, not just now, Rich, but 15 years from now with what I've done. Well, I'm going to try myself. Uh, but right now, it's in the moment, right now, this moment, uh, Roman Ricardo Phillips, the book is heaven. Uh, interested to see what comes next from you. You're just a really interesting writer, interesting poet. Really Thanks so much that. for being here. Rich, it's really a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks it's for having me. It's a pleasure me. for me, too.